This video is brought to you by the wonderful people at Wondershare Filmora. In 1921, psychoanalyst Carl Jung devised the first theory that people could be broken down into eight different personality types. During this time though, psychology did not apply the scientific method, so rather than being based around data or research, Jung's theory revolved around his own personal experiences with people, and the categories were interpreted through his lens. It wasn't given much validity back when it was created and has no validity in current times. In 1943, Isabel Briggs Myers, who was a mystery novelist, and her mother, Catherine Cook Briggs, a magazine writer, happened to read Jung's writings on personality types, despite having no academic background or qualifications in the field of psychology. Myers and Briggs decided to take inspiration from Jung and created their own test, which expanded the number of available personality types from 8 to 16. One year later, they published their writings, and it became so influential that even to this day, it's taught to first year psychology students, even though it has no scientific basis whatsoever. Jung himself later admitted that the concept of classifying humans was nothing but a childish parlor game, and that every individual is an exception to the rule. In 1970, L. David Meech, a wildlife biologist, published his book, The Wolf, an ecology of an endangered species. In it, he included observations he made of a pack of wolves in an American national park, where he apparently witnessed that a male wolf seemed to lead the pack. His book became wildly successful, and his notion of the alpha wolf became popularized in culture. Twenty years later, however, he attempted to replicate these findings, this time in the wild. Upon doing so, Meech had realized that he'd made a huge mistake in his previous works. He discovered that there was no such thing as an alpha wolf, and that the supposed leaders of the pack were just the parents overseeing their young. Having realized his mistake, Meech publicly disavowed his past research and the term alpha wolf, even going as far as to demand that his book be removed from libraries and store shelves. But he failed. Despite Meech's research being discredited by himself and other biologists numerous times over, the bogus concept of the alpha wolf had entered the mainstream, and is still believed to be real by the majority of people. The term was eventually adopted in other parts of the animal kingdom, notably among primates, to describe which male among the group is the most aggressive and has conceived more offspring than any other male in the group. But, much like the wolves, this was flawed, and there was no way to quantify who is the leader and why it might be the case. In 2005, pickup artist Neil Strauss published the best-selling book, The Game, his guide for men on how to become successful in finding romantic partners by adopting traits similar to creatures in the animal kingdom who are seen as the most virile by their mates, including being aggressive, standing out from the pack, and treating women as conquests and not people. As you've probably suspected, Strauss called this type of man the alpha male. As time progressed, the idea of the alpha male became more well known as an attractive prospect among men, in order to construct them a personality that's believed to be desirable to most people, especially in regards to straight men trying to attract women. But it was also seen as a way in which men could find respect among other men. By being a dominant leader who's outspoken and extroverted, resilient, desirable, confident, physically attractive, stoic, and naturally stands above all those who are near them at any given time. In male-dominated online spheres, the idea of the alpha male grew to immense proportions, and it became an aspiration for many in these communities to achieve. It also became the case where men who were unable to or refused to aspire to being an alpha male were admonished by those who subscribed to the idea that it's something that all men should do in order to improve society, since it gives them so many benefits from having strong, capable men in charge of their lives and the lives of the people around them. As such, the term beta male came into existence, with the intention of being derogatory towards men who allow themselves to be emotionally vulnerable or meek. Eventually though, men within these communities decided that there was another type of male who deserves to be celebrated and admired just as much as the alpha male. This came to be known as the sigma male. 
Someone who has similar attributes to the alpha, but is more closely related to what's considered a lone wolf type. A person who's self-sufficient, doesn't require or openly desire companionship, and remains silent out of choice. Much like the stoic protagonists found in movies, video games, and TV shows. Men who can take charge but choose not to, who can seduce women whenever they want but choose not to, and are admired by others even though they don't say it. It's allegedly quite difficult to attain the status of a Sigma male, and later on we'll go over what others claim is required to become one, but much like Carl Jung and Myers-Briggs personality types and Meech's Alpha Wolf research, is a concept that was born from flawed and unprovable human observation. What qualifies as a Sigma is malleable. It's based on a feeling shared by multiple men who themselves want status, therefore it's more of a pseudoscience than its progenitors. Given that what had already supposedly been defined as what kind of man should be at the top, what was it that compelled men to come up with another type that equaled it? Was it an admission that the idea of alpha males is inherently flawed and not everyone holds that type of personality in high regard? Or was it because the men who desperately wanted higher status came to the consensus to change the requirements, which just so happened to be in better alignment with their own lifestyle, in which they're isolated from the world around them and lack friends or partners, to convince themselves that they don't want the attention of others or their validation? that underachieving is a decision that can easily be undone if they wanted, and they're surrounded by admirers who won't openly say what they think of them because they believe that they don't need it. Let's have a look at Sigma males, and why they're lying to themselves. Before we get started, let's talk about this video sponsor, Wondershare Filmora. I edit my own videos and I've been asked by people quite a few times, how do I get started and how hard is it to learn? I myself use Adobe Premiere and even though it's good, it's also a bit overly complicated, especially for beginners. Wondershare Filmora is a superb, easy to learn and robust piece of video editing software, whether you're just starting out or even a long time video editor. With Wondershare Filmora, you can make amazing looking professionally produced videos with ease. It's loaded with all the features that you'd expect from your editing software, including keyframing, color correction, chroma key, all of it's there, but it also has fantastic features like its own stock library, which includes titles, pictures, and even GIFs from Giphy, or Jiffy, AI portraits where it can intelligently cut out your background without a green screen, and Possibly the easiest to use motion tracking I've ever used in an editing software, which I can say for certain is a huge pain in the other ones I've used. It's easy to download, just go to filmora.wondershare.com, click on the download link in the top right and follow the easy instructions. Or if you're on Mac, you can just go to the App Store, search for it there and click install. If you're someone who said that you've always wanted to try making videos but don't know where to get started or what you should use, seriously, give Wondershare Filmora a try. It even has a trial version as well, so you can give it a test run. We all have to start somewhere and Wondershare Filmora can help you make that start. The download link is in the description, so get started right now. Actually download it, but watch the video first, that's why you're here after all. If you've never heard of Sigma Males before, first of all, I want to congratulate you for managing to avoid the worst parts of the internet. It must be nice. Secondly, allow me to take that peace of mind away from you and try to explain what a Sigma Male is. And I say try because there is no set definition on what a Sigma male is, a detail that hopefully by the end of this video will serve as evidence that it's completely made up. It will also serve to illustrate that it's ever-changing just to suit the needs of those who want the status. Sigma males bear some similarities to alpha males, but have some notable differences. Men who are considered alpha males are outgoing, charismatic, and the center of attention wherever they go capable of leading a group of people with ease. Sigma males, on the other hand, are supposed to be insular people who are highly intelligent and unlike alphas, they keep to themselves. Alpha males are supposed to succeed and gain favor from others by using their social skills. They can be intelligent, but it's not too important, so long as they're able to take charge. Sigmas, on the other hand, are expected to be what they call a silent leader. 
someone with high levels of intelligence who can make important decisions for themselves and others, but not need to command a room to do so. How someone is supposed to be a leader without actually talking is beyond me, but okay. <laughs> Good luck with that. Sigmas prefer not to be part of the group though, as I said earlier. They're lone wolves who are out for themselves, but one thing that's made clear by those who subscribe to the ideals of alphas and sigmas is that sigmas could transition into being an alpha male if they want to. That if they've achieved this status, then they automatically have the ability to switch depending on their situation or even desire. To the outsider, a sigma male might look like a loner, someone with few or no friends, single, insular, and perhaps poor communication skills, but these are traits that are not only allegedly a requirement to being a sigma, but is considered a choice. They apparently don't need friends, but they can easily get some if they wanted to. They apparently don't need a girlfriend or a wife, but they can if they wanted to. This isn't to say that if you are any of these things, then it makes you a failure. Even if you don't subscribe to the ideals of male hierarchies, lots of people are happy being introverted and having a small circle of friends, myself included. But given how this just happens to align with the kind of lifestyles within these communities, they have some red flags and we'll talk about those later. Let's just say for now that the idea of being able to switch personalities at will or find companionship with ease is kind of like someone saying that they could do a backflip if they wanted to, but never actually have done one in front of people. One last stipulation that I want to make is that people who believe in the Sigma male mindset, along with the existence of everything else in the male hierarchy, almost universally identifies as a cis heterosexual male. I'm sure there are a very small contingent of people who don't identify as such, but given that much of the literature online is aimed towards men and their interactions with women, it's safe to say that this is more than likely the case. Many characters within fiction are held up as prime examples of what a sigma male is. They all fit a specific type, reserved men who take action when it's necessary. They don't strive for greatness or to be admired, it's just a byproduct of them doing their thing. They're influential and notorious. They don't need help from others, but they'll help others if they happen to align with their interests. Many of them adhere to the anti-hero archetype, someone who doesn't exhibit all of the traits of a hero, but is capable of heroism. They may even be reluctantly taking action because their hand has been forced. According to their community, some examples of Sigma characters include Han Solo from Star Wars, Clint Eastwood's characters in the Sergio Leone westerns, Max from the original Mad Max movies, Geralt from The Witcher, and possibly most famously, John Wick from... John Wick. Interestingly, Keanu Reeves as a person is also considered to be a Sigma male too, largely due to him being quite reserved. Even though he's reportedly a very friendly, outgoing person who values relationships and always goes out of his way for people. You could even consider innumerous anime characters to fit the trope similar to this, such as Light Yagami from Death Note, which, if we're being real, is basically just an incel fantasy, Guts from Berserk, and Sasuke from Naruto. Some even say that Tyler Durden from Fight Club counts as a Sigma male, and I cannot begin to describe the problem about idolizing a character like him, given that he's supposed to personify everything wrong with aspiring to hypermasculinity. The Joker might also be considered one, but honestly, there's so many memes mocking that that it's really hard to tell whether it's actually a serious thing, but it wouldn't surprise me if they were serious about it, sadly. If you've consumed any of these products, you'll notice that there is a theme among these characters, that they're all deeply flawed in some way. And with some, it's been the case where when they were initially introduced to audiences, people didn't consider their flaws. Let's take Han Solo and John Wick, for example. Han is indeed a very capable, smart, and charismatic man, but he's also incredibly entitled. He talks down to other people and treats women like objects, especially in the original trilogy. John Wick is a tragic character. He lost his wife, the one person in his life that mattered to him. Then his dog was cruelly put down by an arrogant Russian mobster, which compelled him to come out of retirement and take out his anger by killing hundreds of people, which, if we're being honest, is a bit of an overreaction. 
John's reasons for continuing his rampage in the sequels changes to him needing to survive, but his inability to process his grief properly in the first film was the catalyst which resulted in a lot of people dying at his hand. There's another argument here about how this also ties into American cinema glorifying violence, yet condemns more intimate acts such as sex, but that's a whole other thing unto itself and maybe a topic for another video. If people actually gave a crap about my videos on media analysis, please watch them. They're good, I promise you. If these are sigmas, then they're not worth aspiring to. In fact, people like Han Solo serve as a reminder that you should care, and that keeping people close to you is a good thing. Most of these characters aren't created purely with the intention of admiring their actions, but learning from their faults and seeing how they develop. Sometimes you may need to do a bit of digging to find the deeper meaning, but I'd say that on most occasions that it's fairly blatant. With a movie like John Wick, it can be hard to see past the meticulously choreographed ballet of violence to see the flaws in John. But it doesn't take a genius to realise that his poor decisions put him in peril in the first place. Then again, I guess it's not all too surprising. Men's rights activists who often subscribe to the ideals of Sigma and Alpha males completely fail to recognise the meaning behind the red pill in the Matrix, even though the creator Willy Wachowski, a trans woman, made it explicitly clear that it was a metaphor for her and her sister's desire for transformation, going so far as to imitate the actual medication used for hormone therapy. Despite it being made clear as day though by the creators, these men still maintained that it meant being awakened to the fact that feminists are taking over and men are at risk. Expecting these men to understand subtext in these movies is like trying to teach a dog to understand trigonometry. It's impossible. So what's so appealing about these characters though? Well, they represent men of action. They're usually against insurmountable odds, yet still manage to overcome them. They're admired by other men and desired by women. They also tend to not be hypermasculine, which is generally considered to be the alpha archetype. These alleged Sigma male characters are generally fit, but not bulging with muscles or anything, and they usually dress well too. One very notable trait among them though is that they're more often than not morally grey, and therefore they don't go along with the crowd, hence the lone wolf title. Lastly, these characters are portrayed as being above all men around them. Even when the world doesn't recognise them as such, we as an audience are shown that should a character like John Wick aspire to use his considerable skills as an assassin to climb to the top of the considerably long ladder in his world, he would be able to do so. Also, what, off topic here, but why are there so many assassins in the John Wick movies? Like, why is this necessary? What's going on in this world that requires there to be, like, an entire assassination industry? Seriously. Ultimately though, despite being admired so much, these characters are fictional, and they can pretty much only exist in fiction. This is media, our day-to-day -day lives are far less interesting, and these personalities won't translate well into it. For decades now, male protagonists in movies, especially action movies, have served as wish fulfillment for male audiences. As we've moved away from the hard-to-attain hypermasculinity which was typically found in 80s movies, the type of men that we see appear far more easier to achieve. They're valued more for their skill and don't try to actively impress people with it. I believe that it's no coincidence that many of the traits of these characters also happen to align with those who aspire to achieve Sigma status, and they ultimately want recognition for what they are by the people in their lives. They want the world to see their value and, more than anything, they want to be seen as better than other men. Mom, I don't have social anxiety. It's called being a Sigma male. What the hell did that mean? You wouldn't get it. Hello, my name's Chadler and I'm a business major. You should really spend more time with your friends. Mom, I don't have friends. I have clients. When you graduate college, you're going to be poor. When I graduate college, I'm going to exploit the poor. We are not the same. I don't need a girlfriend. I'm a lone wolf. Girlfriend spelled backwards is lying Women say I'm a misogynist, and I say women are a liability. That's called equilibrium, bitch. In the animal kingdom, many species of creatures fight, especially the males. 
It can happen for various reasons, whether that's for defending their territory, protecting their young, or even for which one has the right to mate with females. The latter isn't how all animals engage in courtship though. Many male animals will try to show off in front of potential mates. For example, in the bird kingdom, it's the case where male birds have brightly coloured feathers that they use to attract females, who generally lack these colours. For example, here is the female peacock, or peahen as I found out while writing this, and he is the male in all his glory. Even among mammals, you'll see certain displays, like how harbour seals will make specific noises to attract a mate. They'll also do some sick tricks, like diving, head flicks, and other fancy stuff, just to show that they're DTF. If you don't know what that means, I'm not going to tell you. It's interesting to think that with humans though, among hetero relationships, it tends to be the opposite, where in many societies women have been conditioned by tradition and the media that they need to put in the effort to attract a partner. There's all kinds of factors that play into this though, like the existence of language, behaviours, social dynamics, and being burdened with the terrible, terrible gift of consciousness. But all animals have their own rituals, and we'd be here all day if we went deeper into human relations. Men may not feel the need to try as hard as women do when it comes to presenting themselves to the world. We don't feel as pressured by society as women do to ensure we look presentable to others. Also, just a little aside here, because in my past video about the beauty double standard, I got a whole bunch of men claiming that they have it harder than women when it comes to looking good. While I won't say that the pressure for men to look good hasn't increased over the years, something which I actually mentioned in the video and you would have known had you not ran to the comment section so quickly, I just want to say, no. No, you do not experience more pressure than women. Look at how much makeup women buy compared to men, how many clothes stores there are for them, how skincare is directed almost exclusively at them, or even how it's mostly women getting cosmetic surgery. You could even consider the fact that there are entire stores, like big chains of stores, dedicated just to underwear for women. Like, when was the last time you saw a men's underwear store? Never, right? I say this with all due respect. Men, it is not harder for you. It's hard for those who weren't genetically blessed, but it's much harder for a woman who's in a similar situation. Stop making excuses and playing the victim. Until you know what it's like to spend an entire day walking around in heels or finding it impossible to find pants that don't have pockets because designers prioritize fit over function, you cannot say that you have it harder. <clears throat> Okay. Anyway, regardless, there is this idea that much like in the rest of the animal kingdom, men have to compete against each other, not only to find a partner, but to find status among other men. There are various ways in which this is achieved, including social standing, being charismatic and or being funny, being intelligent or even being successful at seducing partners. Many also consider physical traits as well, and although many countries have different standards as to what constitutes the ideal male physique. In the West and a lot of parts in the world, physical fitness, conventionally attractive features, grooming and height are considered necessary to be seen as a man who deserves to be admired. Possibly the biggest signifier of status though has to be wealth. And in order to show off, people will do anything from driving expensive cars, having an expensive house, or wear designer clothing. Some might say that the last one doesn't apply. Look at Mark Zuckerberg. He just wears jeans and a t-shirt that costs... Wait, how much? That thing that looks like it's from a $15 Hanes multi-pack of t-shirts costs $400. Wow, keep it humble, Mark. Yeah, real, real Sigma energy there, Zuck. If we're looking at this from the perspective of animals attracting mates, then you could say that all of this posturing or displaying is a way of attracting a mate, but I would argue that human males have been conditioned to use their status or try to achieve status to compete with other men, given how much value humans place on social standing. The Sigma male allegedly does not care about social standings, but still places importance on all the material things that other men supposedly do. They're supposed to be wealthy, dress well, have nice, expensive things, all the while pretending that they're not trying to impress others with it. 
Sure, you can buy expensive things just because they look nice and not because they're expensive, but let's face it, you can dress well or have a nice looking living space without spending $6,000 on a gross Eames chair that looks out of place. Like, look at this. This guy looks like he wants to watch TV while experiencing the ending of 2001 A Space Odyssey. For some reason, male living spaces are either super depressing or poorly conceived. Seriously, if you can afford to drop two to three grand on lights, just use it to console an interior decorator instead. It is a bizarre contradiction that at the core of being a Sigma male, not wanting to be admired, but doing things that people do to be admired, not wanting a partner, but doing what you can to be desirable, saying that you don't care about social hierarchies while cultivating your personality to be on the top of it, claiming you're an individual while trying to adhere to a set of rules that lots of other men abide by. It's the illusion of individualism put together by men who think they know what the world wants from them, that not only believe they've figured out the formula for how men should be, but to actively promote it, to convince others into admiring them, which, once again, is a contradiction. Just think about what it means to be cool. People who care about being cool are deemed uncool, but those who don't go out of their way to be cool are often given the title. Whether someone is actually trying or not is up for debate. A cool person could be spending hours every morning picking out the right pair of sunglasses and preening their hair to look as though they just looked like this when they got out of bed, but you get what I mean. Being a Sigma paradoxically means not caring about what others think about you, but in reality, caring deeply. It's a way to tell the world that you need to be validated for your decisions while acting as though you don't care about it. It just comes across as disingenuous and honestly, a little desperate. People who don't care about how the world sees them don't go onto YouTube to watch a two hour long Sigma affirmation video about why they should be more like lions. And yes, I sat through all two hours of this garbage just for this video. Please support me on Patreon, I am suffering. If you watched my last video through to the end, you'll remember that I said I was going to start putting time aside in my future videos to boost other creators, so please indulge me for a moment to go off topic and hop on the boost bus. I'm not going to call it that, that's, that's a terrible name. If you can think of a different name, then please let me know in the comments. This time I want to show you the work of Tanya Ramirez Cuevas, otherwise known as Turaku. She's a full-time professional illustrator from Mexico who currently works as an illustrator for social media animations, along with occasionally doing book illustrations. She specializes in sequential art and loves portraying various forms of beauty in women, with an emphasis on diversity of body types. Taraku also has a Webtoons comic called Influenced, where a geeky girl gets a job working alongside influencers and finds that the glamorous lives that they show to the public aren't quite what they seem. As you can see, her work makes gorgeous use of pastel colors, filled with vibrant pinks and purples, lots of bi vibes. Oh, and who's that handsome fellow right there? Apparently I might be making a bigger appearance in the story at some point, probably as the uh, hot new guy in town. Probably. If you want to check out Taraku's wonderful work, you can visit her on Instagram at taraku underscore art, and you can see her portfolio at behance.net slash taraku. You can also read her great webcomic influenced on webtoons.com. I'll leave links in the description, so please support smaller creators. They could always use your help and maybe tell her that Solari sent you. Anyway, back to the video. If you know anything about the culture of alpha males, sigma males, pickup artists, and incels, you'll know that it's impossible to discuss them without also addressing that they and their community have almost inseparable ties with the alt-right. There will be some people who subscribe to the idea of male hierarchies that don't associate with political affiliations, but regardless of this, many if not most men who believe in this stuff either identify with right-wing ideals or have become more susceptible to them given their proximity to the community. The idea of Sigma males was in itself a creation of a prominent figure in the alt-right. Theodore Beale, known online as Vox Day, is a far-right reactionary author and politics and video games blogger. He has a long history of making inflammatory comments online towards famous people, and just in general being a sad man that spends his days 
complaining about SJWs and feminism. Vox Day was the godfather of the idea of Sigma males and essentially established the hierarchy of male dominance that became accepted online. There's alphas and more recently Sigma males at the top of the pyramid, but going down from there there's beta males who are seen as subordinates to alphas, deltas who are blue collar workers who don't aspire to much, gammas who are avowed nerds or SJWs, omegas who are social outcasts and or incels, and finally lambda males who are, unsurprisingly, men who are attracted to men. That's right, Vox Day believes that even though sexual success can determine where you belong in a pyramid, if you happen to like men, then you're somehow below incels. Vox Day claims that sigma males are charming psychopaths and high-functioning omega males, men who don't concern themselves with the hierarchy but effortlessly sit at the top when they can be bothered with it. In fact, when you see images of the hierarchy, you'll notice that Sigma appears at the top, but completely separated from it, implying that they don't care about their social standing. But as I mentioned earlier, that's obviously not true. Each of these ranks exists in their relation to women though, specifically how successful a man is at gaining their attention. The alt-right, men's rights activists, and the men who subscribe to the hierarchy of men place little to no value on women, mainly treating them as a sign of status. Alpha males are expected to only associate with conventionally attractive women, and if they don't, then they're at risk of being demoted. Similarly with sigma males, even though they supposedly don't concern themselves with attracting partners, when they do, they're required to be with the kind of women that alphas would pick up. These men are also of the belief that feminism is the reason that they're being removed of their status, and that as society has started to progress and the idea of what a man should be has changed, they need to fight, not only to maintain a status quo, but to ensure that others understand its importance, and in turn have them understand why they're desirable. They believe that this is just how things should be, but it also offers a very simplistic and narrow-minded template for men who are insecure in themselves. Having a checklist for what constitutes as a desirable man gives men a way to figure out whether they're doing things properly, all the while refusing to pay attention to the needs of others, believing that if they abide by the rules, then they'll automatically attract people to them who want to be in their orbit, and benefit from their status as they're doing so. The alt-right, men's rights activists and incels have little if no love for women, and the hierarchy of men solidifies this belief. The culture has been built by men who have been romantically unsuccessful, and instead of taking the time to figure out what they actually want from a partner, they blame them for having their own desires. And when these desires don't happen to include them, some men will say that the women are at fault, that they're a nice guy and women don't appreciate that, that they just go for assholes. Then in turn, they created the alpha male, which has a stark similarity to those alleged assholes in that they're aggressive but emotionally unavailable when it comes to talking about any feelings that might make them look vulnerable. That's the irony of being a sigma though. It's a creation of men that are so emotionally vulnerable, so much so that they cultivated types of personalities that refuse to accept vulnerability and in the process harming themselves by refusing to come to terms with how they feel and how they might feel about the world around them. Let me make this abundantly clear. Just being nice doesn't entitle you to anything, and women don't dislike nice guys. Like almost everyone else, they like people who are genuinely confident and passionate about who they are and what they like. And it's fairly easy to tell when someone's pretending in order to impress others. It's the little tells that give away the fact that someone has been looking for advice on how to talk to people, like maintaining an intense amount of eye contact, constantly smiling like you're waiting for someone to take a photo, or responding to statements with the phony enthusiasm of Jimmy Fallon. Okay, as someone who used to be terminally awkward around women, and I tend to keep to myself when I'm around new people, I think I'm qualified at this point to offer some advice since I've been happily married for a few years now. I know a lot of people, especially men, don't like hearing that they should just be themselves around people. But if you're someone who's shy or finds it hard to cope with social situations, that can feel like bad advice. What I would do is clarify, be the yourself that you think you can be. 
If you're a genuinely nice person, then you shouldn't have to say it. People should figure that out for themselves. If you're smart and interesting, don't brag about it. Just talk with people like normal. They'll figure it out for themselves. Look presentable. Get a nice haircut. If you're not sure what to go for, then just ask your barber or hairdresser for a recommendation. They know what they're doing. You can dress nicely pretty cheap these days. This jacket here was like $60. I sometimes wear it outside of these videos too, and I've gotten a lot of compliments for it. And maybe wear a fragrance as well, but just don't overdo it, please. Just let people know all the good things that there are about you, and eventually someone will like you for that, possibly even love you, and if you need to work on yourself a bit, then don't read or watch these bogus guides about how to be a sigma or alpha. They're garbage, and they don't work. It's also worth noting that even if you're the most bona fide sigma or alpha male on the planet, not everyone is going to be automatically attracted to you. I know it may be hard to believe, but there are plenty of women in the world who don't find Chris Hemsworth attractive. At the end of the day though, these personality types are absolutely meaningless. You can try and fit the mold, but ultimately you are you. The more you pretend to be somebody you're not, the more uncomfortable you're going to feel in your own skin. At the beginning of this video, I mentioned Jung's personality test, Myers-Briggs, and the Alpha Wolf study, all of which have been definitively proven to be scientifically inaccurate. If you want to split hairs, the only thing close to a valid personality testing thing is the MCMI, or Millen Clinical Multi-Axle Inventory. But that's used as a psychological assessment tool used to gain information on psychopathology and psychiatric disorders, not whether you feel comfortable singing in front of others or alone. Our personalities are ever-changing throughout our lives. Who you are now could be completely different from what you'll be in 20 years, 10 years, or even less. And quantifying what you are doesn't explain how you fit into the world around you. You have to figure that out for yourself. And Allow the people in your life to help too. Trust me, I'm an INTJ. I know these things. As for Sigmas, let me put it this way. According to the men who believe in this stuff, becoming an alpha male is hard. If you're a shy guy who spends most of their time at home on the internet and would rather spend your Saturdays being yelled at by children while playing League of Legends rather than going out to the bars, if you're not living a healthy lifestyle or not paying attention to your grooming, there's a good chance that the thought of trying to become an alpha seems like a daunting task. And I'm fairly certain that the guys who love to tell people how to be alpha aren't exactly practicing what they preach. You'll probably have noticed by this point that the requirements for being a sigma have suspicious similarities to the lifestyle that many of these men lead. It asks that you be a loner who doesn't talk much, someone who doesn't express themselves emotionally, that they believe themselves to be the most important person in every room that they enter, how being morally grey is a strength and that they don't have to care about others so long as they look out for themselves first, is an ideal that treats others as a hindrance yet demands that they give them respect despite not really doing anything to earn it. It is a fantasy that's all in their head where they believe that being insular and selfish affords them admiration. And if they fail to recognize that, then it's an issue with the world who refuses to see what's so great about Sigmas, which, to be frank, is nothing. As I said not too long ago, reaching what they consider alpha status is hard to achieve. The Sigma male was created so that men who refuse to change themselves for the better have an excuse to not only continue with their isolating and possibly destructive behavior, but to see something to be prideful of. In fact, there's a good amount of research that proves that being alone can actually be bad for your health, and puts you at a higher risk for a variety of physical and mental conditions, including high blood pressure, heart disease, obesity, a weakened immune system, anxiety, depression, cognitive decline, Alzheimer's disease, and even death. It's convenient for them to pretend that the world admires them, and when companionship doesn't come their way, they can claim that it doesn't matter, that they don't need to have meaningful connections with others because they're a lone wolf. It's a lie though, and I'm sure that deep down, if you're a Sigma, you know that. You could argue that it's some sort of defense mechanism, albeit one that's shared among a group. Change is really hard, and it's easy to make excuses for your behavior, but 
If your desired personality is similar to that of Dennis Reynolds from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, change doesn't seem like such a bad alternative. Hey, you're, you're a sad, pathetic wretch of a man, so desperate to be loved. Go out into the world. Learn about people. Listen to what they have to say. Learn about yourself in a process. To be a Sigma is to be in denial. To be respected and loved means that you're going to have to be willing to offer it in return. Change is scary. It's really scary. But it's far less scarier than waking up one day and realizing that choosing loneliness was a huge mistake. Well, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then please don't forget to like, subscribe, turn on the notifications, all that stuff really helps. And leave a comment if you want to as well. That All of that engagement stuff really does go a long way. Um, I also want to thank all of my wonderful patrons that you can see scrolling up here right now. Uh, they all chip in a little bit every single month uh, just to help out with the channel. Or you have some annual subscribers as well where you can actually save a bit of money by doing so. I also want to offer a special shout out to all of my patrons that donate $5 or more each month. And that goes out to Lin Ran Jiang, Paulius Jonasus, Grant B, Jay, Jordan Kristoff, Idaho Judd, Matthew Torres, Rach, Eleanor, Enrique Gutierrez, Eric Espinosa, Quiet You, Eric Espinosa, Nathan Frenrin, Nathan Frerin, Murger Girl Fashion Armor, Alina, hello, it's Leo, hello, Jay's Reviews, Ratums, Mandy Sprecher, Games, Martina, Sander Panda, Ashton the Platypus, CB Hart, Kevin Quarber, Logan Roan, Sharfay, Nostricon, Lexi Vice, Mariam, Mickey Buonadonna, Floof Pants, Tamara, my name is pronounced like Neve, Maria Stubberd, Your Sweet Pea, Catherine, and Steve Ma. Thank you all so very much. Uh, you, any donation of any amount really does help out the channel. Sorry, my cat's causing trouble in the background. But yeah, thank you very much. Um, I also have the Patreon question of the video, uh, which you can sign up for when you uh, become a patron. Uh, Andrea this time asks for my top three exotic dishes or foreign cuisines that you'd like to experience someday. I'm gonna make myself look very inexperienced now. Um, I've already like done a bit of traveling in my lifetime, not a ton, but like I've tried other foreign cuisines, but ones that I like, um, I don't know if you call them exotic, but I really like Korean barbecue, especially beef bulgogi. Um, I guess you could say curry as well, like Indian curry. Um, I enjoy that quite a lot, especially tikka masala, which is actually a British invention, but you know. And I guess one day I would like to try um, Ethiopian food. I've heard mixed responses on that one, but it's worth a shot. Uh, besides living in another country, all foods are exotic to me. That is a lie. Um, America is not an exotic place. Um, but thank you very much for that, Andrea. Um, Andrea, truly wonderful person. Thank you very much. But otherwise, don't forget to check out the links in the description to see some of Taraku's work. Uh, she's a genuinely talented artist, and I think you'll really like what you have to see. And yeah, support small creators. And of course, if you want to have a boost just like you saw earlier, then you can contact me uh, with the subject boost. Uh, make sure you include a bio, links to your work, any samples that you think might be good. Uh, I can't reply to all emails just because I've been getting a ton and yeah, it would be way too much for me to handle, but do know that they are being read though, so don't worry about that side of things. Uh, but yeah, otherwise, thank you very much for watching once again. Thank you for your support, whether it's through watching or through Patreon, and take care of yourselves, take care of each other, uh, stay on that Sigma grind set, and um, I will see you next time. Bye-bye.